Morning everybody, how are we doing today? Uh, we have the luxury of no fans on today because it's 55 degrees outside, probably a pleasant 67 or so in here, so it's actually quite wonderful. I want to first start off by saying I DJ'd Saturday and Sunday brunch this past weekend in the Twin Cities. Man, is it nice to be back to work, to have that sense of purpose and that rewarding sensation of people enjoying what you're doing, you know, putting tips in your cup and just saying, man, you really made this a wonderful experience for us. And I'm so proud of what I'm doing because a lot of my DJ friends didn't think I could kind of do what I'm doing. But I'm playing quite a lot of jazz and I'm using it as a glue to kind of segue between songs and genres and uh, feels. And you can kind of come out of some electronic powdery stuff with some nice light guitar jazz and sprinkle it in for a minute 30 to three minutes. You know, it depends on the tone, and, but I just try to find a rhythm, that tempo that's kind of familiar with where I'm at, my set. And I'll throw that tempo in there, whether it's low, slow, mid, high tempo, and it just adds that color and luxury and uh, a richness of experience. And it also convinces the 40, 50 year plus set that okay, this guy's worth paying attention to, and he's not just gonna kill me with child music all day. And of course, I'm a grown man, the, the gray beard kind of fills that in for people, but uh, when I was clean shaven and short hair, I looked a lot younger, I think. On a regular basis, people thought I was quite a lot younger than I was, but it's just nice to be back to work, you know? Uh, I love the comments I get from people as they walk out, you know? And unfortunately, with a white audience, which I'm predominantly playing for right now, you have to wait for those comments as they leave to know that they had a great time. Uh, if they put a 20 in your cup, you're like, okay, I guess they did have a great time. A room full of black folks, even a few tables full of black folks, you'll know if you're hitting them. You know what I mean? If they dig in what you're doing, they're going to make some noise. They're going to tap their feet. They're going to uh, hoot and holler a little bit. And the more black folks you get in the room, the louder and more bushes they'll become. And boy, if you get some 30 to 40 year old black ladies in there with a few drinks in them, they can electrify the entire room. And you'll know, you don't need to wait for them to walk up and be like, oh, you killed it. You'll know that you're connecting with them. But with white folks, you gotta be a little bit more patient. And, uh, but as they start leaving, you're like, okay, yeah, they're, they're loving it, they're digging it. You know, they don't nod their head quite the same way or tap their feet quite the same way. Uh, your best hope is you see some people singing along. That's what white folks do. They'll sing along to some stuff, you know. You go, oh, I know the words of this one. I'm comfortable with that. And then with black folks, I think it's more just about a beat. Oh, I, I love this groove. I love this beat. And they're kind of beat, you know. But white folks need words for the most part. They want to sing along to songs they know. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as they know it. And the drunker they get, the more comfortable they are with whatever you play, as long as they know it. You know, the Macarena can be fun as heck at 1 o'clock if I'm wasted. You know, that's how they think. <clears throat> um, I've just really been enjoying it, though. You know, it's uh, a couple weeks of Rabbit now, and Red Cow, we, did, we launched this Saturday, which is where I was for a long time before COVID. And so Red Cow, Red Rabbit, thank you to you guys. We're going to do what we can to make these incredible Saturday and Sunday brunches. That'll be really unique in both neighborhoods. You know, it's not like you're going to have a lot of other places. You're going to have a guy playing vinyl, you know, a couple 300 records there playing, sorting out, curating the moment, making a backdrop, a soundscape to your morning. Uh, it's, it's, it's something I really take pride in. I really enjoy it. And my ability to lace jazz throughout. And I play jazz more in the first 90 minutes than the last 90 minutes and kind of have a more up-tempo uh, more current, more pop-based, R&B, hip-hop, you know, reggae for that middle section. But the, the surrounding edges, I kind of use it a lot to bring up and then bring down. And I use a lot of pop, jazz, vocal stuff, you know, Peggy Lee kind of stuff. It's just, it has such a comfort and, and people are like, it's so hip. They know it's hip, they know it's cool, they don't know what it is. You know, even when you play Fever, they're like, oh, I love this, but they don't know it's Peggy Lee necessarily. But, uh... <clears throat> There's certain artists you can just kind of dig deep into and play some really cool, doesn't have to be necessarily really familiar to people when you're playing early in a set as people are just kind of walking in. You know, you want to have that crescendo, that climax for sure. You know, give them some usher that everyone can sing along to. 
but uh, it's fun to mix it up and get jazz part of it. And it's interesting because I noticed this before Red Cow, and I got a clear indicator of it yesterday in as clean a the definition word wise as I can get it. <clears throat> One of the hosts who, Greg Gal Carmen, she's been there several of the weeks as I've, as I've done this Red Rabbit gig. And uh, I was playing some jazz kind of like this. Uh, I think it was on an Argo label, actually. And uh, she's like, this is really cool. It's kind of like jazz, but it's not jazz. What is it? And it was as jazz as it gets. But again, it's that conception that people have, misconception, that jazz has to be complicated, difficult, unfun to listen to. And I probably bemoan this thing too much, but it's just insane how small a percentage of the jazz history is eye squinting, ear bleeding cacophony. And yet so much people's perception of what jazz is, is just that. It blows my mind. It makes me crazy at times. And you know, the jazz community is partly to blame. The collecting community is partly to blame. Uh, the people who buy records are kind of more the hey look at me look what I can listen to kind of crowd a lot of the jazz consum consumers are more oh yeah I like the most complicated difficult thing ever from Frank Zappa to Albert Eiler you know I mean I, I'm really I'm edgy you know I'm really cool and so those records also cost more because they were rare didn't sell you know they were at the tail end of jazz when jazz sales were in the tank and so buying them is expensive so you want to show off and go like, oh, I spent 300 bucks and found this cool whatever record and it just leaves this vacuum where the people of today never get to remember or recognize how much wonderful pop melodic beautiful jazz was made that was the main body of jazz you know that's it's it's the main history of the music was being a popular music to be danceable and fun and it was the squinty eyed stuff that came along at the very end that most even the jazz peers were like, we're not sure, is this jazz? Let's call it avant-garde, let's call it, call it free. Let's call it the new thing. We don't really know what to call it because it's not really jazz as we know it. And it's under that umbrella today with that term, but that term is kind of way too broad in its definition. It just encompasses so many things and it can be very misleading. And I think we really have to make a decision to promote all sides of the music and to remember how much of it was completely digestible, entertaining, easy to eat food. And the popular crowd today, they're just that, they're popular music fans. So they're going to chase after what's popular now and never dig deep enough to get back to Peggy Lee. And it would be up to jazz fans to say, hey, you know what, Peggy Lee made some great records with some great jazz musicians. Julie London makes some records with Jimmy Rowles that are fantastic, very accessible. There's so much great jazz, it's really easy for anybody to get into. And yet their conception when they hear it in the, in the, in the, in the setting is like, that's really cool. It's kind of jazz like, but it's not jazz, what is it? That's pretty interesting. I mean, it's something I've been saying for a long time that I perceive, and there it was, cut and dry. In her mind, this was way too cool and easy to like to be jazz. And she's actually a very broad, musical young lady. She knows her stuff. <clears throat> her dad's from Spain, so she's got this broad scope of music and in input, and she sings a lot of things you would never imagine. Like, oh, she knows that, cool. <clears throat> and yet, jazz to her has always been presented as something kind of awkward. So I just wanted to mention that because I think it's, it, it really backs up a lot of what I've had to say about this stuff for a long time. And Sal Salvador, who we're listening to right now, who on the Bethlehem made a couple of great records. Uh, that's jazz. Feeling is jazz. Listening is jazz. Screeching, it's jazz, but it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a branch. Let's leave it at that. What's uh, also interesting 
is there's been a lot of discussion on the Facebook groups and even on this channel about labels and how important are labels? Do you need to know about the labels? Can you just buy the artists? Can you just, yeah, and most people are gonna start out buying artists. You know, that's to be expected. And it's interesting how people who don't collect labels or pay attention to labels will dismiss it like it has nothing to offer them. I could gain nothing from knowing more about the labels. And Sal Salvador is a great example of if you know labels, you'll know what Sal Salvador's are going to be the jazziest and which ones are going to be the schmaltziest. And the difference between his work on Decca, which is good, and his two records on, Sa on Bethlehem, maybe three actually on Bethlehem, it's dramatic. And it's one example of the label a guy's on will impact greatly what liberty and freedom he's given, how he's going to be sounding, what he's going to be packaged as, uh, what kind of songs he's going to be presenting, who's going to be producing and arranging, how big are those arrangements going to be versus improvisation. There's, it's clear cut. And the difference between making a record at Blue Note versus Capital is very defined. And so you might not think knowing the labels is important, but when it comes to even buying and collecting records, you can really know, know, learn a lot and know a lot about what you're going to expect on a record just by looking at, oh, I like this artist, what label is it on? And with pop singers, boy, it makes the biggest difference in the world. Because a pop singer, a jazz pop singer, on a jazz label is going to make a record with a piano trio, maybe a guitar player, and those records are gonna be wonderful. And she's gonna be in that setting, which is gonna emphasize her bluesiness and her jazziness and make her or him more comfortable to be a jazz singer. Because very few of the singers of the 40s and 50s and 60s were just jazz singers. They were also pop singers, they were also gospel singers. They were also whatever their label demanded of them. And not very many of them existed purely in a jazz form. Uh, <clears throat> imagine if Peggy Lee had made, managed to make a record or two at Riverside, you know, with a Philly Joe Jones and a, uh, a, a Sam Jones and uh, Winston Kelly. How great would that have been? You know, and she does make some great records that have really jazzy influences. But these gal singers especially, uh, Teddy King, Lurleen Hunter, there's so many of them. Uh, one of my who makes a record of Atlantic 8000 series is probably going to make a fairly bluesy sound. You know, that same artist who makes a record at RCA is probably going to have some big orchestra behind it with big arrangements and string sections and be quite saccharine. And the big labels had a very, very different demographic in mind for who was going to buy their pop singer records. And so labels do impact so many ways on what you can expect from even an artist you like based on the label that's promoting and producing that product. And so there's infinite things you can glean from the labels that have a lot of insight, uh, from racial components to uh, just the sound and style, how cutting edge was this label going to be? When was this label the cutting edge? When were they kind of trend followers or when they trend setters? Uh, when were they kind of past their prime? All that stuff really does kind of glue together to create a very interesting three-dimensional puzzle of what was happening in music at that time. And it, it's it's not that easy to grasp without the layer that the labels provide you insight-wise and perception-wise and geographically even. You know, there's a great gulf between New York and the rest of the country, as I talked about in the last episode. If you're a New Yorker, the west side of the Hudson River, that's middle America. Teaneck, New Jersey, that's <laughs> Ohio. Minnesota, like it's, Minnes New Yorkers are so New York centric. And if it matters and it's important in New York, it must be important. And I think a lot of New Yorkers get that in their mind regarding jazz. And like I said, in the rest of the country, jazz is very, very peripheral. And it's probably exists more as a once in a while we'll go see a jazz show somewhere in a theater or maybe you have a jazz club in town that does pop R&B stuff and real jazz once like even the Dakota in Minneapolis it's a pretty good jazz club but a lot of stuff a lot of times the stuff they're doing is real crossover with pop and uh, other sounds you know commercial sounds and I don't think jazz exists as a 
very popular selling album commodity anymore. Uh, we probably saw more of the back catalog from the canon than we do of the new artists out there. And no one really buys CDs anymore from what I'm told. And so many of our small artists can't really afford to press vinyl. And the press vinyl that they do make ends up being 40, 50 bucks, which scares people away. It scares me away. I might take a chance on some of those kids, but I don't want to pay 50 bucks on a chance. You know, I'll take the, the tried and true, time stamped, approved music of the 50s and 60s for the most part. Uh, I am curious to hear things at times, and I do dig into stuff once in a while, but uh, most of it comes up short for me and my needs. And again, I want to always remind people that it's important to recognize what this music means, what its legacy is. It's not just the legacy of difficult music and complex arrangers and really great improvisers and virtuosos. That's so a misconception. And the most of the things even I thought of and had been told and read and perceived about jazz really falls short when it comes to really truly defining its legacy and what it really means. And I don't think there's another genre in the history of music that's more incorrectly represented in posterity. It's the blues is still the blues and people recognize how the blues is connected to sorrow and it relieves you of the blues and no matter how white a cat is when they play the blues people recognize this is a black music this is a black art form and jazz with as many different incarnations it's opened the door to many people thinking that its legacy is stuck in the great virtuosos of this genre and so much of the later chapters of jazz it's all about virtuosity and the brilliance of my composition and I've talked about this stuff a lot but it's a feel music it's an urban translation of the blues it's getting something off my mind that's the, ma the magic and the legacy of this music is of real global importance. It's not just a local folk music. It's not just a dialect of a time and place. It's survival of a people. In the face of great tyranny and great oppression, this art form was birthed. And I think for a lot of white Americans, it's tough to sometimes hear that stuff. And the Egyptians didn't want to hear what Moses had to say about the Israelites. You know what I mean? We give you guys clean water. Shut up. You know what I mean? Go eat a biscuit. And people don't want to be in chains. They don't want to be in captivity. And the longer you keep me in chains, the more I can actually tell you what freedom looks like. And it's that voice of these people in the wilderness being fed the remains of the pig, working tireless hours in, in the field, absolute brutal heat and humidity in the south, oppressed, freedom taken from them, no economics, just a sexual and spiritual liberty that powered them through, that jazz manages to encapsulate so wonderfully that's something to be revered it's sacred ground as much as the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want has a staying power the power of Armstrong and Ellington and Coltrane and Parker and Monk and Miles that legacy even though we don't necessarily perceive it in our own eyes, in our own time frame. Through the lens of history, it will be seen as a great moment in the history of art. And we were, I was going through some Argo records last Thursday, Friday. I went through probably 15, 16 of the Argo labels. 
and they're just the Chicago black experience poured into wax. From the two time in man to the drunken blues to the gospel of the church, that whole black experience comes out in words and in playing and it satiates and embalms and salves the pains. And I think we get so confused if we think, oh, it's gotta be, that can't be jazz, that's too, that's too nice. And that's just incredibly incorrect. So we're look, working on launching podcasts that enough people will say they are interested. And what we're gonna do, I think, is keep new content available in podcast form. And then I'm gonna try to, every week or two, add four or five back episodes to the podcast format. Episodes I think are highlight episodes. And slowly we're gonna put those episodes into the podcast uh, format as well. Still kind of learning my way through it. My wife's been doing a lot of research. She gets this stuff a little better than I do. Uh, I, we're hoping to have the first podcast available within the week or maybe two weeks, depending on what happens with other things in our lives. But uh, it's coming together. Thank you for all your feedback and input on that. That was very invaluable because we certainly didn't have uh, a much idea where to start with that. But we, it looks like Apple and Spotify and Google Podcasts will all be available. We just got to pick the housing agent or whatever it's called. And so we're working on some of that details. My wife's got it, some of it figured out. And so we're excited about that opportunity just to get more people out there talking about jazz. And again, none of this has really been done as a financial venture. My YouTube channel doesn't really bring in a lot of revenue. Uh, the Patreon does bring in some income every month, which thank you to all you guys. You guys are very invaluable to me. That little extra kick of money every month always finds a necessity that we're like, oh, we need to pay that. Oh, we can use that money. Thank you. It's a, it's a blessing. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for that support. Now, this record, I was going to talk about the end of my last episode. My phone memory got full. I'm like, I'll just cover my next episode. So I kind of clipped that off short. So I didn't feel like running upstairs and emptying my phone and coming back down for one last little tidbit. But this kind of my early record I listened to the other day. It's just insanely good. The lineup is... Blue Note Riverside Prestige quality. Cannonball's really on fire. He's young, he's hungry, he's got something on his mind, you can tell. Uh, this is kind of at the dawn of Hardbop. You know, uh, Clifford Brown, Max Roach have been doing their thing kind of 53, 54, into 55. And of course, Clifford passes in 56, I think it is. Uh, and Parker was 55. But uh, Cannonball is kind of on that cusp. He's right there. He's hungry. He's worked with Savoy, with him and his brother Nat. And Nat Adderley is one of the most underrated players in jazz. And people say that under, underrated thing a lot. And sometimes you say so-and-so's underrated. I'm like, that guy's far from being underrated. But Nat Adderley really is one of those guys that you can get a lot of stuff as a leader. Some on Riverside, some on Atlantic. But they kind of go unnoticed, even though they have great lineups all the time. The guy has a lot of fire and ferocity. He's in that Freddie Hubbard, uh, Clifford Brown, uh, Booker Little mold, where he's got just a lot of fluid fire. He's not as smooth as Clifford Brown, or even as Freddie Hubbard with that dexterity, but he's equally got great tempo, great phrasing, great... Uh, melodic and rhythmic structure to what he's doing. It always has a great pulse and a great sense of melodic. <laughs> oh man, that was Nat right there. <laughs> doing his thing. Uh, this band, this record here though, there was the yeah, last day when I looked last week, there was six or seven copies of this on Discogs. Under 50 bucks, some as cheap as under 10 bucks because they were goods, good pluses. And a good plus of this on Emerson means it's an old 50s pressing. We'll probably play through most of that damage just fine. It was going for $8, $10, $12. That same condition 
of a Lee Morgan on Blue Note would go for hundreds of dollars. And it's just one more example of how the jazz vinyl community online has really pushed Tone Poets, really pushed Miles Davis, really pushed John Coltrane, really pushed Blue Note, even Prestige has quite a big, and yet the same artists with incredible lineups will go unregistered. No one cares. Oh, that's just Cannibal Adderley, I don't even know. The guy made some of the greatest records ever. You know, his record of Blue Note, something else with Miles and company, uh, Sam Jones, uh, was it R. Blakey and Hank Jones? Uh, that record. <laughs> they got to Jimmy Cleveland. If I were, let, let's just look at the band real here. Julian Cannibal Adderley, of course. Jimmy Cleveland on the trombone, the best trombone player that no one's ever heard of. <clears throat> Jerome Richardson, who was playing the flute a minute ago, also plays saxophones and other reed instruments. Richardson's a brilliant player that's on hundreds of sessions. Cecil Payne on the baritone sax, who has some great records at Savoy and is a great player at this moment. Nat Adderley on the trumpet, who we just spoke about. J.J. Johnson shows up on a couple tracks. Paul Chambers, legend. John Williams, piano player that people don't know about very well, was a great player. And then Max Roach and Kenny Clark are on the drums on different tracks. That's Blue Note Prestige Riverside Royalty. If you took a second to look at it, and it's on the Emerson label out of Chicago. Emerson is one of the most important record labels that today's jazz fan really overlooks. The Clifford Brown Max Roach stuff is on Emerson. It's an incredible label with Sarah Vaughn and Donna Washington and so many greats of this moment. And in 55, 56, they have a real back catalog of pre-LP stuff that they're kind of putting out. But what's current in 55, 56 is as cutting edge as anything else that's happening at Blue Note or Prestige. And yet, this record sits in disc dogs, over six, eight copies of it, original pressings, all of them under 50 bucks. And if this was on Blue Note, it would cost you 500. It's just insane. It's a great lineup. It's a great record. Emerson stuff sounds outstanding. Great album covers. You know, it's a really well packaged, put together label. Beautiful. Look at that. Just gorgeous. Uh, and also because Emerson was part of Mercury, Emerson means M Mercury R Record C Company. Mercury Record Company. You know, and so that's what Emerson stands for. So this was Emerson's jazz imprint in the 50s. And it gets phased out about 60, 61, and everything just moves to the Mercury main parent label. But uh, because it's a Mercury enterprise, it does mean that because Mercury had a record plant in Chicago and one in St. Louis, that Mercury Emerson stuff has really good distribution compared to a Blue Note, Prestige, Savoy, Bethlehem, those type of labels. And that means that they got repressed several times. And um, sometimes they change the cover, sometimes they don't. But it means that a lot of those MRC records are out there in better quantities, which also explains why they're not as expensive. Because they sold well. And because they had distribution, like a Verve. You know, Verve, Verve and Mercury were kind of these mid-level labels at this point, where they had better distribution than the really smaller labels and were more national where they were, went, were going. And Mercury had that power to get into a lot of markets uh, around the country where Blue Note wasn't even thinking about sending records yet. You know, so it does mean that this Emerson stuff is more readily available, more affordable, and it's really awesome. It's outstanding stuff. If you don't know, check out those Clifford Brown Max Roach records. That's the dawning of Hard Bob. The melodic restructuring of bebop with stating the heads of the songs playing at tempo but with more remembrance of the original melody and playing it from a very agitated aggressive emotional place and that's what the blue note sound is 56 to 59 60 that's that blue note hard bop sound 
So, by all means, if you say you like an artist and that's what you buy and collect, don't avoid the lab the labels that you don't know as well. Avoid, if anything, the labels you do know well. The same great Cannibal Alley when he goes to Capitol, he's a bit of a shout out of his former self. He gets kind of forced and pigeonholed into making very much more commercially digestible, shorter tunes, stick the head, do a little short improvisation, make the songs more familiar. We'll do stuff from the pop charts and from musicals and from uh, what's happening on the theater stage. Cannibal got pigeonholed into something that had he been at different labels in that time frame would have probably made much different music. So Cannibal's Savoy stuff is good. His Emerson stuff is outstanding. Blue Note stuff is great. Riverside stuff is great. And then he goes to Capitol and it really shifts the sound. Uh, Columbia. So many people think Columbia is the greatest jazz label of all time. And 90% of Columbia's output is schmaltzy, uncollectible garbage from the 50s. And the number of good jazz titles they have is pretty sparse. If you print out, which I've done, the first 2,000 Columbia records, it's only a few hundred in there that are jazz titles. And of that, only a couple dozen are really cutting edge, collectible, uh, still considered important pieces today. There's a lot of jazz on Columbia that's really kind of fallen by the wayside. And again, part of that's because it's so widely available that there's a lot, of, a lot of it's out there. But there's a lot of stuff from Columbia that's landfill stuff. And Columbia doesn't do a lot of cutting edge jazz. They're still doing Armstrong and Ellington in the 50s, even in the 60s. And it's really, they come to Monk late in the game. Monk's made a lot of music before they signed Monk. You know, the, like I said, that Jazz Messenger stuff they do in 56, 57, and then signing the Miles Quintet. And Brubeck was a fairly safe signing. You know, there's not a lot of cutting edge stuff. The Donald Byrd, Gigi Grice stuff is great. But Columbia gets a little too much. And of course, Columbia goes back a long time. But Columbia also has the benefit of being in those early periods and buying out little labels as they folded and, and folding all that material into their catalog. So a lot of that stuff wasn't actually Columbia Studios and producers and uh, talent scouts finding these great records and buying them and producing them. It was just them saying, oh, that label folded, let's buy it. Anything they're worth putting out, uh, let's reissue that under the Columbia name. And so they do get credit for some stuff they didn't really do. Uh, I'm not an expert on pre-war dates. I don't think even some of the Columbia Billy Holiday stuff was originally Columbia. I could be wrong on that. But uh, I know Columbia certainly buys a lot of little labels up and issues that stuff as their own. But that being said, Columbia just still does uh, a really important job. You know what I mean? They do the job of jazz across the country that really no other label could do or would do. RCA does some good stuff as a major label, but it's much more, we're only gonna really tackle white guys and a couple safe black cats. Capital was almost exclusively white cats. And even though they had some good cutting edge West Coast stuff, they were still worried about selling Sinatra and Martin records and they didn't wanna mess that up. We're not gonna put it on a bunch of edgy, you know, angry young black, Eric Dolphy, Bobby Hunt, we're not touching that stuff. And people don't have their perspective because they don't collect labels of when these big labels did start to do that. They're always a year or two or more behind what the little labels are innovating. You know, it's, it's very clear when you collect. So Columbia did take more risk, as I've said many times. And they do deserve the credit for that. But uh, Columbia is just not one of the greatest jazz labels of all time. In spite of there being a lot of great titles on Columbia, they're a great record label. They're one of the greatest labels of all time. And they had a big impact on jazz. But uh, there's too much on that label that's dictating other definitions of what Columbia is. So anyway, Cannibal Adderley on Emerson, Outstanding stuff. He does about five titles here. All of them have great covers. In fact, let me pull a few of those other covers for you. 
if you're a fan of Cannibal Adderley, if you're a fan of Charlie Parker and his stuff with strings, Adderley on the same instrument does a great record here with strings on em Emercy. I cover the waterfront on a foggy day. Just beautiful stuff. And it's not saccharine. It's real serious improvising by a wonderful player. And I think sometimes the sunshine of Florida, because they're from Tampa, him and his brother, really comes through in Cannonball's sound. And Florida was a weird thing in the U.S., if you're not familiar with the U.S. There's the South and there's Florida. And not to say that racism doesn't exist in Florida, but by all means it does. But it was a different culture. A lot of snowbirds that come down from the North, Yankees as they were called. Uh, <clears throat> it's a much more migratory place than the rest of the South. Uh, much more people from all over the country come in there. Uh, we have a huge Cuban population, Caribbean population. And so there's a lot of different groups melding together in Florida. That probably makes for a little more tolerance. And there were some awful things to be seen, but uh, Adelie definitely has a bright, positive outlook on life. Uh, this is a great 36077. The 3600 series, the first 100 titles are all outstanding. There's a number of collections in there you have to kind of sift through, but even those are worth finding if you find them for five, ten bucks. They're great. But uh, what a great cover. I love that. This is the color and tone and palette of that. Uh, this one's just called In the Land of High Five. Great stuff. And it's got the wonderful old MRC drummer on it. 36110, another fantastic album cover. Uh, this one's called Sophisticated Swing. And uh, boy, between that car door and that back backside, there's a lot of swinging going on right there. Outstanding stuff. Beautiful old mono pressing. Another fantastic lineups on this. This is with Nat, Junior Mance, Jimmy Cobb, and Sam Jones. That's a Riverside. You know, I mean, that's prestige. It's high-level stuff. Uh, Nat Adderley gets two records in the late 100 series, 36100 and 36091. Um, that's the famous MRC peel. Some of the lacquer on some of these MRC records will start to peel off, which actually can do, be beneficial because it can get you a record that's really great, even less expensive because of the cover peel. And uh, I think it adds a certain charm, and it also tells you about the vintage of the record. It's not a later reissue if the cover's peeling like that. These are these Nat Adderley records are both awesome, fiery stuff. To the Ivy League from Nat, and just introducing Nat, both great records. Both both come after his Savoy introduction as well. And then these next three titles are kind of after Emerson is kind of sort of being phased out. Uh, Adderley's already left for Riverside. But Emerson and Mercury are still putting out some of their back catalog of Adderley stuff. This Cannonball Adderley, Jump for Joy, 36146, has a Mercury and an Emerson release. Uh, this next one is uh, Sharpshooters, 36135. Again, this has Emerson and a Mercury number. And then this one's fantastic, Cannonball Adderley Quintet with Chicago in Chicago. This is basically that Miles group from Kind of Blue without Miles. It's, uh, they were in Chicago, and they recorded this together with Coltrane, Kelly, Chambers, and Cobb. <clears throat> it's pretty insane stuff. And there's not Miles kind of taking up a lot of the space. So you get to hear Cannonball and Coltrane kind of exchanging ideas, which is fun, because Cannonball can dart about, and Coltrane's got endless ideas. So to hear those two kind of Pissing back and forth, it's fantastic stuff. It's really a great series of records. And most of these records will go for, the Atlanta Coltrane one will sometimes creep up towards 100, but, and I hate the cover. It's one of my least favorite covers. I can't stand it. That little nose, I, I, I was in style for a while, but I can't stand it. But uh, <clears throat> it's great stuff. People ignore it because of the label it's on or because they don't know, you know. People say they don't care about labels, they just care about their artists. Well, that's Cannibal Adderley, how can you not know about him? Why are you passing those over? Uh, and the old Emerson titles, like most labels from that day, they can look kind of scuffy, and they can have some surface marks. You won't hear them, because the groove, the record stick, the groove's deep down. Most of that surface stuff won't even show up aud auditorially. 
you know, it's and maybe that's me not being a high fi guy going, oh, they sound fine. They sound fine to me, and I'm still able to glean all the spirituality and and necessity emotionally from these records. So I'm gonna wrap that up today with that. Adderley is fantastic, and there's more to him than just that Blue Note Riverside stuff. You know, that early Adderley Brothers stuff is outstanding. The stuff on Savoy, uh, Bohemian, all that stuff's killer. Uh, Nat's a guy you should pay attention to. And those Emerson records. And going through those Emerson collection over there, looking for those Adderley titles, you see the Jimmy Clevelands and the Max Roaches and the Clifford Browns. And there's some just incredible records in there, man. Emerson's a giant of a label that doesn't get the love it deserves. As is Argo. And Argo's more anonymous in some ways. You know, they do have some name brands, some Ammon, some Stitt. You know, <clears throat> there's a Max Roach record. But the Ammons, the, the Argo stuff, for the most part, aside from Ramsey Lewis and Ahmad Jamal, most people are going to know those names to some degree. And those two guys kind of kept Argo going, sales-wise. Allowing them to do a lot of that really cool stuff that Argo does in between. And Argo loves the blues, man. Argo loves that Chicago black experience. And even Emerson, Mercury, they were there to document a lot of what the black musicians were doing. A lot of these labels had talent people that knew that what these black kids were up to. This is serious stuff. It's worth recording, even though it goes against all the ideology of what white supremacy is telling us and how we should be a white-dominated culture. What these black people are doing in response to that, it's got so much guts. I need to document that. That's incredible. Alfred Lyon heard it in spades being a Jew from Germany. Don't tread on me. Don't tread on me. And if you're going to tread on me, don't give me a saxophone. I'm out. You have a great day. Thank you, Patreon. If you want to support the channel, please go to Patreon in the description below. There's some great merchandise for sale in the store. Uh, Look for the podcast coming soon. I'll try to announce something by the time I make my next video later in the week. Y'all be safe. Have a great day. Peace.